so this type of uh, crepe abuse, you know, um, again, like uh, Laura said that, the, you know, the, the crepes will still come back, you know, year after year and put on, uh, you know, really a fabulous uh, flower show as, as they would. Uh, but today, uh, what well, Laura, you um, can I talk a little bit about this 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 yes. not recommended landscape practice real quickly? Please. So um, when I was in Florida working, Dr. Ed Gilman was working there, and he actually did a crepe murder study. So he um, had some identical crepe myrtles in his uh, Southern Tree Conference research area, and he pruned some of them like this and did not prune the other ones. And so therefore um, he uh, was able to um, evaluate because people say, oh, I do this so that I'll get more flowers, right? You hear that mung mung, right? I'll get more flowers if I do this. So he evaluated flower number, flower size and overall floral display. And when you do this, well, you get delayed flowering. So you don't get flowering as early, which is a thing with crepe myrtles because they're kind of like late flowers, which is great because in August they're, they're going and most things are tired. But um, you get delayed flowering. You do get larger flowers, like the flowers could be very, very large, larger flowers if you crepe murder, but you get fewer flowers overall. So in the end, a shorter and less dramatic floral display. Ta-da. That's all I have to say. Research. All right. You can look it up. Uh, what about let's go to the uh, the next page. Ooh, this, this, yes. Yeah, Laura. Uh, uh, well, you called me. Remember that? Uh, I, you know, during that. Yeah, go ahead. Tell us what I happened. Did. Well, so I received some some uh, pictures from an arborist who was uh, asked to look at these crepe myrtles. And you'll see that these are standards. They're, they're pruned to a single trunk. Um, these crepe myrtles at, in a parking lot in South Lake in Tarrant County. And um, just ask me what was going on with this? You know, why were, the, why were they losing bark and the canopies declining like this? And I did not know from the pictures. I did not figure it out. This is one of those situations where it really made a difference to actually do the site visit. And so Mung Mung was coming up and she agreed to go with me. Uh, we went out to the site. We um, evaluated the situation, and it was a really interesting day. So, mung mung. Uh, so you can see that uh, you know uh, what you see here are uh, I mean the barks. You know the the barks on these uh, uh, crane myrtle trunks are literally kind of receding. It almost like it almost looked like uh, you know some. Uh, uh, some type of whatever that is, uh, whatever that is, uh, you know, just kind of either chew in either insects or uh, or disease or fungus or uh, chew in on this type of thing, you know, chew in on this type of thing. And and if you just look at it, just just the poor bark. And then we know that bark is very important uh, for uh, plant survival. It just somehow it's just it's just doing this. And and there are uh, some cases, you know, the the plants are not as bad you know the damage on these are not as bad as some are really bad i mean as you can see that there are uh you know uh the bark are not even connecting uh, with each other so basically it's kind of giving up and this is uh this is, i think this is a specific one that uh almost completely just died and then you know you see some of the uh uh, uh some of new shoots sprouting from the um you know, from the from the base. Uh, by the way, uh, we have a very distinguished guest joining us today, Dr. Gary Knox uh, from University of Florida, uh, who just won the International Plant Propagator Society's uh, Meadows Award, a very pre prestigious award. And uh, and Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Knox posted the the the, the crane murder study that Laura just mentioned in the chat box. So check it out. So oh, thank uh, you, Dr. Gary Knox. Yeah, uh, so, I should have been more prepared with that. Appreciate let's, it. Let's let's. Go to next page. Okay. Um, I wanted to say that when we got there, you know, it, it's really important to just take a minute to walk around and look and think about what's going on. And that really helped us in this particular situation because we did see a pattern. And when you investigate, you're always looking for patterns. But 
what 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 do we see, Meng Meng? So what do we see? So so obviously, you know, with with her really cool shades on, Detective Laura <laughs> was was on. Yeah, uh, this Miss uh, Detective Laura was was on something. So this is the. So this is a crime scene that, as you can see, you know, that I summarized here. This is a parking lot. This is a parking lot. And the, uh, uh, at the bottom here, that's where the, uh, the grocery store is. That's where the grocery store is. So, so all these, you know, the, the picture uh, corresponded with uh, three rows of crepe myrtles with different levels of, uh, with different levels of damage. So this row, this row here, uh, this is the worst one. This is the row of crepes with like the worst, absolutely the worst damage. And, and, and as you can see from the picture here, you know, there are some dead ones. And as you can see from the, uh, the canopy of the, uh, of these crepes, uh, just, you know, not flushing a lot of dead uh, twigs and stuff. Um, this is the least damage, almost, uh, almost no damage, uh, if you ask me. So, uh, so this is the worst. This row is the worst. This is the uh, the the least damage. And this row here, this row here, is somewhere in between. I mean, this row here is just somewhere in between. So um, we just look and look and look and look. So what do we find? So that's the situation there. That's the situation there. Uh, so I'm gonna pause. Or let let's uh, let's uh, uh, pause. Uh, Airfan, we can uh, let's uh, maybe ten seconds, and then we'll go to the next one. And I wanna uh, <clears throat> ask the audience, you know, uh, what do you think is causing this problem? Let's stay here for about ten seconds, and then go to the next slide. Type in the chat, you know, type in the chat that, uh, you know, what you think the, the problem it might like be. It has nothing to do with rivalries between, um, you know, SEC universities, land grant universities in the South, nothing, nothing to do with any of that. Well, uh, I have a little uh, SEC uh, uh, experience myself. I, I got my PhD from my SEC. I worked in the SEC. And when I, uh, you know, got my job uh, at Texas A&M, um, I thought I was getting out of SEC, but that year A&M just joined the SEC, so. <laughs> yeah, I was totally pro, totally pro. So there you go. Um, okay. Airphone, let's go to the next one. All right. Suzanne, what do you think the problem is? I, 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 is there anything in the chat? Uh, no, no. The chat no. is still about the SEC. I would like a closer up image. I, 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 you the know, close up, close up this, would be the two slides. Would be the two slides uh, uh, back. So can but, we go? Yeah, we could go back. But actually, this is not a situation. You know, a lot of times you're like, oh, I got to get my hand lens out or something. But this is not that kind of situation here. Mm -mm. It's not. Suzanne, if you have any specific question, let us know. Um, <clears throat> I think I don't remember. I don't remember whether we have uh, whether we consulted with uh, uh, Dr. Gary Knox and at <laughs> oh yes yes that's exactly what uh, Gary said back then was it uh, a malaria root rot and <laughs> was it a malaria root rot? Um, so we 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 did look we did look at the you know at the soil. I mean, we look. Oh, I mean, oh, oh! Uh, I, did you see that Airphone actually gave you uh, uh, um, the the hat and the uh, the 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 oh, magnifier? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, Airphone. Oh, wow. I, I, that's impressive. Right. Yeah. Let, let's you needed go to some. The next one. You needed some uh, detective accessories. Yeah. Yeah. All I, right, I, uh, Suzanne. To answer your question, so this is one. I, I, uh, the. You know, upon close inspection, so this is the the three sections of the uh, of the of almost the same plan, I think. So this is the, at the you know from the bottom, the bottom one to two feet tall. It looks like this, and then the in the mid section, it looks like this, and then that this is the uh, you know the upper section five, about five to six. Uh, 
uh, foot, uh, uh, feet above the ground. So you can see that uh, this is uh, very severe. This is severe. This is less severe. This is the least severe. You know, just on one plant, on one plant, it, it seems like the severe part is is right here, about the six, about the six, uh, six, uh, six feet tall. About the so uh, it seems like the bark was scraped away as it grew. Um, Laura, how would you describe how the bark was damaged? Strangely, yeah, like obviously something happened to the bark, but you're right. It was like you couldn't, I mean, a shopping cart did not run into it. A car did not run into it. You know, that was one thing I thought at first, but, but you know, cars don't, that would be like one tree maybe, you know, or two that, that a car could run into. They don't run into a whole row of trees. And, and also the shopping cart, you know, wouldn't be hidden somewhere yeah. Yeah. Uh, as tall as, as tall five, as six that. feet yeah. tall. You know, exactly. it just, uh, or a car, or a car. Or a car. Yeah. Not that high. Not that yeah. high. Yeah. And, and like this something. is, this is very consistent. This is very consistent that, you know, um, at the, you know, at the bottom of least, uh, you know, least, uh, uh, least affected. And then at the six feet tall uh, level, that's the, that's the most affected. So, uh, next. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I am 5'2". Laura, how tall are you? I'm 5'8". I'm you're 5'8". So you're, you're there. You're about... So, well, uh, if we go back to the, the picture where Laura was, uh, you know, was with that magnifier, you know, that picture, and you can... You, yeah, let's go right here. So basically, you can see that uh, Laura is about the same height as where the main trunk, you know, start to uh, to branch out. So that's that's basically where it is. Yep. That, yep. So we were uh, uh, we were just uh, standing there, and then we saw. Ooh, I mean the glaring, the glaring uh, light. I mean, just, 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 just bad. Just, you know, just the glaring light is just very bright. I mean, very bright. So, uh, so like, um, I, we think this is, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, this is the suspect. We think this is, uh, this is the suspect. And if we go back to the, uh, the picture with the parking lot, Yeah. Thank you. This is a one. So I don't know whether you guys got the clue here. Um, who put this here? It may be me. It may be Erfan. <laughs> so this kind of give you a little uh, clue here. So on this side is the south, the south side. When I, when I told you about where the grocery store is, I said the bottom. And the bottom is, is the south side. So if you... If you look at these rows, if you look at these rows, uh, Airphone, can we go back? Just just uh, get rid of the summary of the crime scene. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so, oh, I, I got it out. So this is, this is uh, it wasn't clear here, but this is where the, uh, the grocery store is. And as you can imagine, the entrance, the entrance will be somewhere here, you know, in the middle. The entrance will be somewhere here in the middle. And if you think about it, where, uh, where would the, uh, where would the, uh, uh, the, the customers like to park? Uh, often as close as, uh, you know, as close as they would like, um, close, to the, uh, close to the entrance. So they will park, uh, you know, from the south side and then, you know, as these parking lots fill up, they go to the north side. So this is, uh, this is how they would like to park. And, um, and uh, so this is the south side, as you can see, you know, this is where the, uh, the grocery store is the south side. And if you look at how these, uh, you know, how these uh, parking space are, uh, are drawn, you know, the the vehicles are right lined up here in this direction. So the early afternoon sunlight, which is, you know, when uh, coupled with, you know, two o'clock is when it's the hottest, uh, you know, the sunlight is not the strongest, strongest, but it's the hottest time. 
So the, the early afternoon sunlight, uh, you know, hit on the, uh, uh, on the, on the, uh, the, the glass, on the front side of the glass, and then uh, it's reflected and right into, uh, into the canopy of the cray myrtle. Laura, you have something to add? I, I just wanted to say that this experience made me think a little bit more about where I park, um, um, just because of the reflected light. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty sunny here in Texas most of the time, and we really can have a lot of reflected light injury to plants. It's, it's interesting. It's, so, you know, so. Yeah, so so in this row, in this row, because you know, if you look at the way that you know the 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 parking lines are drawn perpendicular to the row, so the light only get to reflect on it, you know, during the late afternoon. You know, the late afternoon sunlight will get on it versus this one was the uh, early afternoon sunlight. Mm -hmm. And if you compare this row with the least uh, you know, damage or no damage. There is no, there is no cars parking here. I mean, that's what we saw as the difference, you know, as a difference among these, uh, you know, three rows, you know, the, the most damage, the least damage and somewhere the damage uh, in between. Um, so this is, uh, uh, we think, we think we got the, uh, we think, you know, with all the uh, crime scene uh, evidence that we collected, we think we got the, uh, we got the killer. We got yeah, the, uh, the sun. Friend and foe to trees. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, uh, no, wh where was that? That was in South Lake? Was yes, that in South? South Lake. So South Lake is one of the uh, cities in uh, 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 Tarrant County in, you know, uh, it's between uh, Dallas and Fort Worth, right? Somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, um, uh, this, you know, this thing doesn't happen in a vacuum. There, uh, there are other incidences uh, that, uh, that happen, you know, uh, with similar, with very similar uh, uh, result. Um, when I first came to Texas, I actually got a call from this, uh, this museum, uh, this Dallas museum, um, and uh, they have problem with their, uh, the, they have problem with their, uh, uh, the, the courtyard landscape. And they think it was the light from the museum tower. I seen just you know from the tower just outside of the uh, Nash, the National Sculpture Center in Dallas, and that's causing all the the scorching, the, the scorching leaves, all the damage, uh, you know that uh, uh, that yeah. they are seeing. Um, and they were also concerned not just about damage to their trees, but damage to their artwork because it's a sculpture garden. So that was like the big deal. I mean, I'd like to think they were just super concerned about their trees, but they were also. So, okay. We, we, we would think, we would think yeah. that they are more concerned about the trees, but they, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and then on the left lower uh, side here, it was a, a photo from Associate Press that, uh, the, that, you know, that, that, that sunlight actually uh, was, I mean, you know, the sunlight reflected from the uh, skyscraper was blamed for melting a jaguar uh, parked on the street. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, if it melts the uh, the, the metal, uh, the bark is is just yeah, it's not. And, yeah. and the great Gary Knox pointed out that most of the time when we see um, trees being damaged by the sun, it is in the winter when the tree is a deciduous tree doesn't have any foliage and the sun, the angle of the sun's pretty low and especially uh, thin bark trees like like the maple I'll talk about later or red oaks around here can can really get a lot of uh, uh, sun scald damage in the winter, usually on the southwestern side of the tree. So that's pretty common. So how to uh, prevent this kind of damage? So let, let's say, you know, uh, we found the, uh, the, the killer, we found the, uh, you know, the, we kind of solved the uh, problem. Uh, so for this particular uh, crime scene, how, what, what will be the remedy for this? <laughs> what would be the... You rub suntan lotion all over the trees? Ah, that's fun. Very, very creative. Very Thank creative. You. I don't... I don't... I don't know that sunscreen works like that on trees. I don't mm -mm, never heard of a chemical option. 
Um, there are physical barriers to the sun. You know, one thing is that people definitely want to, they like to park under the tree, but yeah. not knowing not knowing that, uh, you know, that they're causing the problem. And Dr. Ong said, no plants, no problem. Ugh. That's what it deals with dead stuff, you guys. It deals with yeah. the pathogens and the dead, the dying plants. Yeah. Doesn't appreciate the live. <laughs> oh. No plants, big problems. And and I think that, you know, uh, I think these, these I mean, yeah, these, these plants are basically goner. You know, they're... Um, Ah, I like that. Use hedge plants with not. leaves. He is so smart. Yeah, exactly. You could do something like, yeah, hedge uh, shrubs around the crepe myrtles. Um, though, though, part it would be kind of challenging in that space because they they were in small planting areas. But you're right. Something or you know, a physical tree wrap, tree wrap, trunk wrap is is an option though it's not super attractive it might they might be able to find some way to make it cute in the in the parking lot there in south lake i don't know they really uh, i mean that the awareness and you know I yeah yeah. I mean, it was it was such a pity. Those are really nice, you know, specimen single Very trunk nice crepes. Yes. All right, yeah. that's that. Uh, I think is that all. Oh yeah. Well, also <laughs> abusers. <laughs> we got more. So these are. Uh, uh, oh, these... I love the the suggestion from Suzanne. The the yes, there's one of those in my neighborhood, and I really love it. So yes, the where you go and crochet around the tree and. Yeah, exactly. That's a great idea. Very cute. So I'm going to start so, recommending that. So these are not the murders, but these are abusers. As you can see that, uh, you know, when these trees was uh, first, uh, these trees were first planted so many years ago, they had these stuff, you know, used to, uh, to, to stabilize the tree and everything. So one important thing is, you know, take them out when you don't need them because uh, otherwise this is kind of like implanting the, a little foreign body you know into the tree i mean the crepes again just so tolerant of all kinds of abuses and this is uh, this is one of them we definitely don't want this kind of abuse all right that's our that's our that's our uh, let's let's uh, let's keep all the questions uh, to the end uh, airphone do you have other murder stories that you want to share I don't have any more murder. Well, yeah, I guess it's kind of a murder story. Murder of white flies that are trying to murder poinsettias. Uh, so we're talking about a case study of uh, commercial application of biological control on poinsettias in Texas. Uh, and so, you know, many of you uh, may be producing poinsettias. It is the season um, where in about what? About a couple weeks, uh, if not sooner, you all might start shipping these out. Um, so this is basically like the movie Alien, all right, when we're talking about using uh, predators and parasitic wasps. Now, just a quick little background, you know, one of the main pests of poinsettias are white flies. Now, I understand there's also fungus gnats, you know, I know there's years where mealybugs become a major issue or spider mites, but consistent, a consistent problem are white flies. And the one that we face here most commonly are the sweet potato white fly. They cause sucking damage. Uh, they produce a honeydew. <clears throat> and if conditions get really bad, really horrific, then we get the sooty mold, right? And that's when uh, things, things get really bad and scary. And uh, we really want to stop that from happening. And so a lot of us uh, will use rotations of insecticides. So here's week one through 16 of production of some poinsettias. This is an actual rotation. I'm not suggesting you use this. This is an example of a, a local grower and their insecticide rotation, what pests they are targeting. You see, it's, it's usually mostly white flies. The problem that we're starting to face is that we are starting to get um, a lot more instances of insecticide resistance. So of these listed here, these ones with the square box, there have been populations of sweet potato white fly that have been reported to have resistance to these particular insecticides. Now, there are other rotations as well. So for example, here's a publication that lists, this is 11 that I've extracted out of this publication here from Mackenzie et al., and these rotations provide at least 95% suppression of Bemisia, that sweet potato white fly. You can see here the weak number that particular uh, pesticide is sprayed. Uh, however, 
You'll notice of all these rotations, most of them involve at least one insecticide in the group known as neonicotinoids, which has become another horrific nightmare recently uh, because neonicotinoids are under a lot of public scrutiny. Uh, you know, there was this petition back in, I think it was in 2015 that had about 750,000 signatures online. And there were several others with, with hundreds of thousands of signatures to ban the use of neonicotinoids because of their potential impact on pollinators. Uh, and so if you sell to any of the big box stores, you know that you're required to either include these tags that say it was treated with neonicotinoids or uh, they're really starting to be phased out or you've already started adopting a rotation that does not have neonicotinoids. So, there's, you know, not only this consumer demand, but increased pesticide applicator regulations from the EPA and TDA, concerns about re-entry and pre-entry harvest intervals, plant phytotoxicity and pesticide resistance, start to question uh, the longevity or sustainability perhaps of a strategy that relies solely on insecticides. And so this is where I want to investigate. And this is actually a part of my PhD, which I finished uh, just over two weeks ago. Uh, so you're getting a small little uh, chunk of that here. Uh, we want to investigate the potential use of biological control in uh, greenhouse commercial production. So uh, when we're talking uh, biological control, in this case, I'm talking seasonal inoculative biological control. And that's where there is some natural enemy that's being mass produced and released into a protected crop on some kind of a regular interval, such as weekly. And that natural enemy is establishing on that crop over time. So you're starting to get some more and more of these, in this case, parasitic wasps, establishing there and giving you some residual protection uh, against, say, white flies. Now, these are not uh, to scale, right? These wasps are usually quite a bit smaller um, and do not cause any harm, harm to people. And so specifically, the two natural enemies or uh, predators, you could say that I was looking at, one is Eretmosus remicus, that is basically like the movie Alien. They lay eggs uh, just under actually these white fly nymphs. And then uh, the larvae eat the insides of those nymphs as the nymph continues to feed until nothing's left, but uh, basically a carcass of that nymph metamorphoses into a new wasp. So here's that wasp, it's a tiny little thing. And um, combining this wasp with this predatory mite, Amblesius swirskii, which is right here, tiny little mite, which is a predator that feeds primarily on eggs and first instar. So we're looking at using these two in combination because uh, these mites can actually also feed on younger instar thrips and or mealybugs. So they can give some protection against other, uh, other, other pests as well that we can find on poinsettias. But it's also because uh, they have a different say approach, right? So these mites can actually go for a little while without food and can kind of sit on the plant in this standing army approach until some eggs are laid and they'll feed on them. Whereas the wasps are thought to have a little bit more of a seek and destroy so they can fly around uh, and find some populations and lay, uh, lay their eggs. And so before I kind of jumped into that, uh, one of the primary things uh, is to address some of the concerns when it comes to biological control, uh, which one of the major criticisms is that, whoop, sorry. One step ahead. One of the major criticisms is that um, the retailer threshold for pests on ornamentals is zero. Basically, that the store can cannot have any pests on it. Uh, and the second is that biological control cannot produce zero pests. So we want to go to test this first assumption here that ornamentals have zero tolerance for pests. Anytime you tell an entomologist that there's like a hundred plants sitting somewhere with zero insects on it. That's like a, you're like giving them a challenge, right? Um, you can't help but, but try and find something there. And so over two years, 2016 and 2018, visited multiple uh, retailers in the East Texas region and basically scouted poinsettias, either at big box stores, grocery stores, garden stores, or florists, and counted the number of immature white flies, as nymphs and pupae that we found on those poinsettias within 60 seconds that we could find. So you can see here in 2016, we found a maximum of about, oh, say about 30 to 35 nymphs per plant and about 62%, this is a proportion, 62% of the plants had immatures on them to as low as maybe about five nymphs uh, per plant and about 43% infested. 
When we go to 2018, we can see as high as 100% of the plants infested at a florist with about 75 nymphs uh, on average per plant. And the lowest we found was 75% with about 30 nymphs, 25 to 30 nymphs per plant. So you can see this zero tolerance um, is, is not quite true, right? So when we talk zero, it's perhaps undetectable to uh, you know, quick inspection. But when we look very closely, uh, this is, you know, with regular insecticide use, right? And these are growers from Texas, California, and coming in from Canada as well. So these are poinsettias come from all over to these stores, and we're, we're finding uh, white flies on them. So, so the tolerance is not zero, and now we have something to work with. Uh, and we know, again, based on this, that the pesticides are not giving us 100% control. And the reason why we kind of separated out these different um, store types, right? Because the florist, we would expect might have more discerning customers or even uh, the, 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 the store owners. And thus the tolerance would be quite a bit lower. But even then it was 75 uh, immatures per plant, which is relatively high. And again, because, you know, you look at the florist, they're selling a poinsettia for about $50 a pop, which practically the exact same poinsettia at say a grocery store is $8.99, just dressed differently, differently, right? So this one's got a nice, uh, is presented much, much nicer. So in our commercial case study, we worked with three separate growers, grower A, B, and C, I've kind of anonymized them. Um, and within each grower, we had two greenhouses that we were working in. One, conventional control. So the grower was left to their own devices to use their, their regular insecticide rotations. Uh, and then the IPM house, which is where we were releasing uh, these natural enemies. And we would provide that data, our monitoring data back to the grower. From there, they could decide whether they want to do a curative application of a select number of insecticides that are compatible with the, um, the parasitic wasps and predators. So they would not kill them, basically. So here is just a quick uh, little snapshot of exactly what we released or how many sprays we did per greenhouse. We had grower A, B, and C. Uh, again, either IPM or conventional. So Eritmosis remicus was released weekly. So you can see at grower A, Eritmosis remicus, the specific product with, with their pupae, was released 15 times. Whereas the predatory mite was released about every four weeks because they can survive quite a bit longer. So you can see here a total of four applications. And then insecticides, there was five applications of insecticides at grower A in the IPM house. Whereas when you look in the conventional house, they only applied the insecticides four times. And there's an interesting reason for this, which I'll, I'll get into later. Uh, we monitored their, their plants, about 50 plants um, uh, weekly. And let's see, were those loose? Uh, so they were on cards. Uh, so I'll, I'll show in a moment the pupil cards that these Eritmosis remicus were released on. And Amblesia swirskii, the predatory mite, was released through a, a blower, through this like bulk material. So this trial started from uh, as soon as the, the, um, the cuttings were transplanted. So as soon as they're transplanted, we started the release of the natural enemies uh, all the way to the point that they had full color and, and went out uh, for sale. And, uh, you know, we put up some signage. I think this is uh, critical, even if you wish to trial yourself, uh, to ensure that no one's using any broad spectrum insecticides in these houses if you're trialing with it, because those broad spectrums, A, are most likely going to kill your natural enemies if it's a broad spectrum. And secondly, the residual can be quite long lasting. And so you might not be able to come in with natural enemies that particular season or at least for several weeks. Um, you can see here, oh, it's creepy little ghost. So this greenhouse may have been a little bit haunted. Uh, but we also use yellow sticky traps uh, and, and monitored again uh, on a weekly basis. So the pupae were released uh, weekly on these cards just above the plant canopy. Uh, whereas the uh, predatory mites, there's this like little blower that uh, you basically blow them on top of the plant canopy. And you can see all this carrier material and there's basically mites grabbing onto them. So when they float or fly in the air, uh, they land on the plants with the mites. All right, so taking a look at the data. So this is grower A, grower B, and grower C, these separate plots. And these are the uh, number of immature white flies per plant. And actually ignore this. This is not the mean. This is actual, uh, this is what we call box and whisker plots. So these dots are actual quantities on an individual plant. Uh, these boxes represent the, quant uh, the quartile. So this horizontal line right here is actually the median. So the middle 
uh, quantity that we found on the 50 plants that we scouted that particular week. But you can see, for the most part, in all grower locations, the median, meaning the majority of the plants we inspected, had zero uh, white flies on them. But if we had to draw some trends, right, between the IPM house, which is the orange, and the conventional house, which is the blue, we find on, like, kind of on average, or at least uh, on, some, on some trends, we find that the IPM house generally had higher immature white fly numbers than uh, the IPM house. However, again, just stressing, now this is a, what we call a frequency, uh, or yeah, frequency bar graph, where you can see that over 3, 000, almost 3,400 of the poinsettias that we inspected had between zero to five immatures. Very few had anything higher than that. So in other words, most plants had very few white flies on them. Uh, and then the next point that's uh, important to take away is that by the end of the trial, all right, by the time that these are being shipped out, the number of immatures we found on the plants were below that which we found at the retailer. So that's 75 nymphs per poinsettia that we counted within 60 seconds. Uh, in this case, all of them at the end, in this case, grower C never even reached anywhere close to 75 immatures per plant. And we were counting for longer than 60 seconds. We were counting as long as it took to, to count all the immatures on these particular plants. So it's safe to say that by the end of the trial, everything had um, acceptable uh, densities. Now, what's very interesting is that um, like in this grower A, you'll notice the number stayed pretty low the whole time. And you have to remember there's only like four insecticidal applications. Uh, and one of the reasons, and whereas the IPM house had five, one of the reasons is because this particular house, the IPM house had just higher white fly pressure. It may have been that, you know, a, a population had immigrated into there, a larger population immigrated into there compared to the other. It may have been that there, there was a, a particular cultivar that started off with high densities, which is kind of what we saw. We saw the, the population relatively localized on two to three benches started growing quite a bit in population on those benches. And then those poinsettias were spaced throughout the entire house by around the week 36. So all of a sudden we see a, kind of this increase where, um, where when, when those poinsettias were spaced out. So that's something to keep in mind there. Uh, when we look at proportion of plants infested, so now out of the 50 plants, you know, what proportion of them had infestation? Again, you'll see the IPM house between the three in general, had a higher proportion of plants infested than the conventional house, at least for grower A. Grower B and grower C, they're, they're relatively similar. But again, IPM house uh, as a trend has higher numbers. However, it never exceeded 70%. So, you know, we saw at the retailer, in some cases, it reached 100%. And the final uh, proportion was never greater than 50%, which is a, a pretty safe proportion compared, again, to the densities we saw at the retailers. Another kind of uh, interesting note, right? So we were counting all of the immatures on a poinsettia, which can be rather impractical, uh, either for your scouts or for yourselves as you're going through your greenhouses. So we ran a simple little regression, right? Can we um, basically predict how many white flies are on a poinsettia by looking at the proportion of plants infested? And so here on the x-axis, I have the proportion of plants infested, and on the y is a log, so this is log transform data, so it's not linear, uh, log of the mean immature white flies per plant. We find a relatively strong linear, uh, linear relationship after we've log transformed, meaning that perhaps after a little bit more modeling, a little bit more research into this, we can create a nice predictor so that you can just scout, uh, say, 100 plants in your greenhouse, in a specific greenhouse, and based on that model or predict, what the maximum number of white flies is on a particular plant and the average number of white flies on any particular plant. And that would give you a better idea of when to start actually, um, you know, if you're releasing natural enemies, when do you have to do curative sprays, right? Or when do you abandon your natural enemy program altogether and go in with some things that have much longer residual and more broad spectrum. When we look at the economics, which is also a very important factor, right? So we were trying to do release rates that were economically comparable to insecticide inputs, but you obviously have unpredictable things that come in there along the way. So what we find is when you consider all costs, so that's input and labor, we find that the cost can be anywhere between three times to almost half the cost of insecticide inputs. So it really depends uh, you'll see on in this case where it's about half the cost of insecticides, 
they were on their regular insecticide rotation program. So they were just spraying practically weekly, regardless of what they had. When we look at where the biological control program was more expensive was where they were only spraying when they really needed to. So based on good monitoring data, they were making insecticidal application decisions from there greatly reduced the number of applications they needed to do. So they were saving some good monies. So that would be certainly a strategy that would be uh, beneficial to consider. Now, if we consider just the insecticide input costs alone, that can also range between two times to about, you know, 63% of the, the cost of insecticide input. So again, it can vary between being more expensive or being a little less expensive, depending on how you apply it. And I think even if you are applying insecticides, right, uh, an insecticide rotation program can be much more costly or less costly, as we see, for example, if we compare the insecticide inputs uh, between our, our different um, between our different uh, greenhouses, then we can see some major differences. So you, you can basically vary that a lot depending on how you practice different things. So in summary, biological control of whiteflies on poinsettias are promising in Texas. Uh, they can produce an ultimate proportion of plants infested and densities of whiteflies below that uh, found at retailers. And it can be co uh, economically comparable to our typical insecticide rotations. Um, and we might be able to use the proportion of plants infested as a good proxy for density of whiteflies in poinsettias. So uh, now's a good time for any questions. I want to thank uh, you know all, everyone who kind of helped me out with this project, my PhD committee, and research assistants. I also want to really help if uh, really thank if you are a part of the Northeast Texas Nursery Growers Association. Uh, that means that you helped fund my PhD, which, you know, this was only a small portion of it. So I really want to thank you and your support uh, for helping me through that program and everyone else who uh, is either supported by sending us plant cuttings um, or rooted plants such as doom and orange, color spot and almonds, uh, soil from Berger and or natural enemies. So I guess we're going to leave questions to the very end, but I see, uh, let's see, recommended for protecting those. Oh, that's the red oak. Um, okay, so why don't we do the plan of the week before we do overall questions? How does that sound? Sounds, <clears throat> sounds great. All right, let's do the plan of the week. I think, uh, Laura, Laura, are you taking over? Yes, yes, okay. I'm taking over here to talk about the plan of the week. So quite obviously, I wanted to talk about fall color today. And and um, I went out um, and took a picture of a Shantung maple in a park in um, Fort Worth over on your left this week. And it's not really showing fall color yet. Uh, and why is that? Anybody know why we're not having fall color yet? Because we live in Texas. Yes, exactly. Um, because to get fall color, you really need, well, kind of the weather we've actually been having this week. Some, some cool weather, uh, preferably with sunny days, not these cloudy days we've been uh, suffering through, but cool sunny days with cool nights um, and not a freeze. And we got lucky here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and didn't quite freeze this week where, where we got really close to it. But last year, if you recall in 2019, we had almost no fall color except for the color brown, which is not the best of fall colors in our trees because we did have a really hard freeze. Right about this time last year, we got down into the 20s. So all the leaves just turned brown and fell off and it wasn't very attractive. But if you do have uh, that cool, pretty fall weather, like, like some parts of the country have, your, your trees kind of slow down their photosynthesis, and then you have a chance to see all those pigments that are, that are there. They're always there, but they're just blocked out by all the green and the chlorophyll and just all the, the, uh, the important part. It's important to be green if you're, if you're a leaf. It's, it's a good thing, but you don't normally get to see the fall colors. So, this tree that I wanted to talk about, this Texas Superstar, is one of the more reliable producers of fall color here in Texas, the Shantung maple. It is not a native tree. It is, in fact, from... Uh, drum roll, please. Drum roll. Uh... That was the drum roll from Meng Meng. <laughs> it's actually from Shandong province in China, which is... Uh... 
I'm from Jiangsu province. So Shandong province is just right north of uh, Jiangsu province. But in China, we never, we never call this Shandong maple. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally believe that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call it, though. <laughs> Is there a truncatum? You could call it that in China, right? right? Yes, 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 yes. You could call it by its by its scientific name if you wanted to. But it is a, a, a really tough maple. I like to think of it as kind of a mid-sized maple. It's it's not it's not uh, as large as some maple trees, uh, red maples. It's not as small as a lot of the Japanese maples, which are also not quite as tough as this tree. So it's kind of a good size for many landscapes um, that kind of, you know, 25 feet tall, 20 feet wide, fits in your yard, that mid-sized kind of tree that, that a lot of people need in a landscape. It's also cold hardy to zone six because it comes from Northern China and um, it can handle uh, being in a little bit of shade. So if you have another large shade tree, let's say you've got a, you know, a large oak or, or an elm or um, another large growing shade tree, you could also probably add um, a Shantung maple to your yard. And if it got a little bit of shade, it would be okay. So that is a really nice versatile thing for the landscape. Um, also, the reason that it's a Texas superstar, in my opinion, and the reason that we can grow it here, definitely, is that it will tolerate lots of different kinds of soils, especially alkaline soils, which most maples would definitely prefer being in a more acidic soil. So it can kind of handle that. Um, there are lots of, of nice, uh, just, just species trees, but there are some cultivars that have been selected. Uh, that picture up on the upper side on the right is uh, from the Greenleaf Nursery um, catalog. That is the Red Fire Dragon. It's kind of a nice, you know, Halloween-y kind of name. It's a fire dragon. Um, it was actually uh, selected here in Tarrant County by Keith Johansson at Metro Maples. He, it's a selection he found vegetatively propagated, has really consistent red fall color. So that's one. And then uh, there are others. And there are also hybrids. Uh, maples are fairly easy to hybridize. So there are lots of hybrids of truncatum with other maple species that are, that are also nice trees. So um, anybody else have anything they want to say about this? Um, Shandong maple is from, obviously, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, for zone six, so it goes all the way uh, grow to Beijing. So in understandably, like in zone six, you know, it's a reliable, a very reliable uh, fall color versus, you know, here in Texas, we kind of do have to choose the ones, you know, the cultivars and hybrids that, that shows uh, reliably um, a red color in the fall in, you know, under our warm conditions. Um, I specifically changed my background uh, to, uh, I know Dr. Becky Bollins definitely knows uh, what this plant is. Um, <laughs> who does it by this point? Who, who doesn't by this point, right? Are you so, talk about fall color and jujubes, mama? <laughs> well, uh, I, was, I was just going to say that Shandong Maple, you know, the Shandong province, uh, Jujube is uh, is oh. is a big crop in that province. So oh, so, but this picture is actually from Dr. Yall that she took in uh, New Mexico. In New Mexico, you know, one of the uh, one of her uh, research sites showing that you know the fall color of jujubes are also so awesome. <laughs> and that that's so, that's all I wanted to add. I just think you need to you know start start. Uh, lobbying Dr. Pemberton to um, include the jujube perhaps in consideration for one of these Texas superstars, you know. One of those days, one of those I days, we, I will. Think about that. Anyway. Um, All right, well, what about let's get to the questions. Shantung maple, great, great kind of smallest tree for most landscapes. I do have one. I do like it. It's a tough tree. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us, uh, I guess, for another session. This is the Halloween special of Chat with Green Aggies. But at this time, yeah, we, we have some uh, a few minutes to take any questions. I think we're caught up on the chat. Uh, yeah, but if you have any questions, you can throw it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, chime in. 
And uh, Dr. Bowling, is there something you wanted to, to ask our participants today to do? Yes, would you please, I just included in the chat um, the link to our survey. If you don't mind taking a minute or two to fill that out, it really, really helps us out. Um, unfortunately, I do not have any cool Halloween gifts on the survey today, but you could turn on some spooky music while you fill it out and maybe get uh, that same uh, vibe. I don't know, but very, very brief survey really helps us um, to improve the program and, and get a sense of um, what we're doing right and what we can offer to give you more. So. And then uh, Suzanne just asked a question. Um, yeah, so, you know, that was like one part of um, several studies that, that I did, right? And so in one of the studies, we did look at pupil emergence um, and male-female ratios. So it was about 70 to 80% emergence on average and about a 50% uh, male-to-female ratio, again, on average. So they usually stack those cars. They're supposed to have um, 60 pupae, um, or at least that's what they're advertised having 60 Eric Moss's Remicus per card, but it's closer to on average to about 90 per card. So when you factor in the 70% emergence, you end up with about 60, only half of which the, the 30 that are females are actually providing any control. Uh, from there, I did not test, um, you know, their, how, how many, you know, what is their ability to fly or anything like that from there that uh, we did not look at. Laura, there's a question, you know, about recommendation for protection for split embark on mature red oak, um, so, southwest sun damage. So I, I, you know, I did notice that and we went right into um, plan of the week. So I needed to stop typing and start talking. Uh, but yes, I would say that um, a physical barrier is the only thing that I know that's good for preventing sun scald. And I did think that uh, Dr. Knox's suggestion of planting a, an evergreen shrub near the base of the tree might be a good idea. Um, Suzanne's suggestion of uh, crocheting a nice blanket for the trunk of the tree was a lovely suggestion. Um, and of course, there's always boring old tree wrap, but you might be able to dress that up a little bit. So um, you really got to have some kind of physical barrier. And we did see a lot um, back to the drought. If, if you, we talked about that briefly, but in that horrible drought, um, when we saw a lot of uh, defoliation and like early premature defoliation in the fall, you know, where trees were just drought stress and so they started dropping leaves, we saw a lot more sun scald because, you know, there just weren't enough leaves up on the tree to shade the trunk well. So it's always, always a concern on red oaks, always. The, uh, I have seen, uh, I have seen in some landscapes that uh, they paint the trunk white, you know, just yeah. use some kind of a uh, white paint. What do you think about that? Um, you know, I don't know that I've ever seen any studies on that. I always thought it was kind of just something that people did for sort of aesthetic reasons. You know, you hear that, not that I think it looks right, but you know, that, that people did it because they, they liked the way it looked, but you hear that, oh, it keeps the squirrels out of your tree or it, you know, but I don't know that there's any research that's been done on that, or I certainly haven't seen any. Right. Trunk paint. Anyway, I haven't seen it uh, down here, but I have seen plenty of, uh, you know, trunks, you know, tree trunks being painted wide uh, while we're in China. Dr. Knox, if you're still here, uh, I mean, <laughs> if you're, if you're oh, still on. Trunk you, painting research. Yeah, no, 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 no. Do you remember, because uh, Gary has traveled to China before. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I was just wondering whether you know, you have seen, you know, you have noticed that, you know, while you're in tra you're, you're traveling in China. Um, so you say like wh white paint on the trunk, like is that, is that sunscreen basically? Well, it's, it's not sunscreen, but at least it's white. It's kind of sunscreen. Yes, <laughs> Airfog. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it was, it was Airfog's idea all along. I mean, yeah, sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, the entomologist says it and it's silly. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Gary has seen white paint used on fruit yeah. tree trunks. Uh, well, Dr. Becky Bowling found some research here. 
in I did a very, very quick Google Scholar search that might be worth, you know, us looking into. Uh, we could do a follow up on it, maybe. What's Gesunde Pfalzen? Uh, 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 I assume <laughs> the name of the German? So it's, let's find out. I don't know. Yeah, and and Gary, maybe yeah. it's it's used to pre, uh, you know, prevent borers and other insects, but also, you know, it may have it may have a positive, you know, a positive side effect that you know, additional, I say, you know, additional benefits of a ref a reflecting light. Um, you know, sunscreen for trees. Sunscreen it's for trees. Thing. Yeah. It appears to be a <laughs> Russian. Russian publication, huh? <laughs> Russian publication, seriously. It's affiliated with Springer. So, oh, okay, okay. But I can't read anything on their page. So. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to either. But uh, if anyone reads Russian, wants to give us a little summary of that article, we'd, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. Um, it's, about, it's about bacterial infection, though, I guess. So, I don't know if it's, you know. Uh, relevant to sun protection, but maybe, I don't know, we can- It, it looks like there are several articles um, with fungicides applied as trunk. Uh, so not yeah. so much looking at temperature control or light reflectance, but just Fungal. as an application- Fungicidal for action, fungicide. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we can, that'll give us all something to think about in the middle of the night if we wake up. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. What is going on there? Okay. Yes. All, All right. right. So, um, happy Halloween, everybody. Um, yes. We enjoyed yeah. chatting with you. Uh, many thanks to Airfon for making it a lot of fun today. Uh, <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Thank cool. you all for uh, tuning in and uh, thank you all for your presentations. We hope you have a happy Halloween this weekend. And we will see you. I don't know if we have, do we have one scheduled for next Thursday? I think. Um, Get on that. We will be sending, <laughs> y'all will be hearing from us yeah. <laughs> for the next series of Chat with Green Aggies. We're always trying to make improvements. We are having a meeting after this. So uh, you'll hear from us very shortly. And don't forget, please fill out that survey if you have not already. Uh, Dr. Bowling will paste it in that chat again here right now uh, <laughs> for you. Right. And uh, please, it takes like less than four minutes, would you say? And um, that's very helpful for us, right? So for us to continue doing this. It shouldn't take you any longer than the song Monster Mash. If you just turn that on and start completing it, you'll get the spooky experience of completing our survey. <laughs> that is the full experience. That's how it's meant to be experienced. Yes. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you all next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, we do leave for another.